Euh, bonjour, je suis très heureuse de participer aujourd'hui et euh, je remercie à l'IUF de m'avoir invité à enregistrer cette vidéo. Je suis Rosal Azmat, euh, je suis professeure des universités à Sciences Po Paris dans le département d'économie. Euh, je suis également un lauréat junior de l'IUF. Euh, ma recherche est dans le domaine de l'économie du travail et de l'économie de l'éducation. En 2022, je viens de remporter une bourse d'IAC Consolidator pour mon projet Unequaled. Dans cet enregistrement, je vous parlerai de mon projet et plus généralement mon expérience pour obtenir l'IAC, ce qui m'aide à réaliser et peut-être quelques conseils. Avant ça, je vais faire un bref résumé de ma carrière et ma recherche. Um, et je vais continuer en uh, anglais. Uh, I'm from Liverpool in the United Kingdom uh, and I moved to London when I was 18 years old to study economics at the London School of Economics. I continued my studies in London and completed my master's in economics at UCL and then my PhD in economics back at LSE. I also spent part of my PhD at the EUI in Florence as a European doctoral uh, student. Um, I started my professional career at the University Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona. Uh, and after that, I worked at Queen Mary University in London. And uh, since then, I've been in Paris at Sciences Po, uh, so nearly eight years. Um, I've also had some uh, visiting positions in, in places like UCL and uh, in Stanford. Um, I want to talk mostly today about my experience with the ERC, so how I found the process, uh, what it has meant to me, um, and how it's helped my uh, research. But I think an important starting point is the EUF, uh, because I think my EUF project was an important stepping stone for my current ERC research. So I applied for the EUF uh, junior after around three to four years at Sciences Po um, with a project that centered around inequality, especially gaps that we see in education and in the labor market across different socioeconomic groups. And my EUF project asked about the role played by one's aspirations, the, the goal setting to explain inequalities that we see in these later educational or labor market outcomes. So specifically what I wanted to explore in a both theoretical and empirical way uh, was the relationship and, and the distance between what it is that individuals aspire to um, and what they eventually achieve. And, and importantly within this, to understand how this differed across individuals depending on their background and, and characteristics. Um, and equally important thinking about what types of choices are made during the process that could help us understand whether the goals are reached or not. I, I, more broadly, I also wanted to try to understand the role played by society and culture or political landscape and how this might play a role in understanding the, the formation or the shaping uh, of, of aspirations. So when I started to prepare my ERC uh, candidature, um, some of this research served as an important base uh, for the project. And, and I'll describe some of that research in a second, but um, I also, I want to say two important things that I think the, the grant did for me. Um, the first is that the process of writing the proposal for the ERC served as an important purpose in itself. So it gave me the chance to, to consolidate some of my ideas and, and think about it in one big project. So to, to, to think about my research as, as a family of papers that were interlinked. The second is the grant, um, I'd say, has given me a great deal of research freedom. So the funding has helped enable the project to, to build and merge data sets to create new data through experiments and surveys and to, to build a team around the project. So being able to contract the necessary personnel, which would have been impossible otherwise. So now uh, let me tell you a little bit about the, the project and uh, my research. So my research uh, project, Unequaled, 
um, centers around the study of educational constraints in shaping future inequality. So what I found quite fascinating from my earlier work was that young people, adolescents, make decisions, make plans about their education, like the length of their study, um, their, their um, academic track. And, and this planning is then crucial for future outcomes. And, and while it's true that at some point investments are made, changing direction is difficult, there is a time when these plans are, are malleable and so they can be influenced perhaps through policy. So what I wanted to understand is whether different people are subject to different constraints and opportunities and whether this shapes their plans. And then to think about whether if we could change some of these constraints and opportunities, what would happen? Could it potentially close or, or close gaps or reduce inequality? So the, the project uh, covers several different learning constraints at crucial stages in educational uh, planning. Um, so specifically, I, I focus on technological constraints and the importance of the digital divide, on social diversity in the classroom, and on the importance of role models. And, and all parts rely on state-of-the-art empirical methods like large-scale, representative field experiments, surveys, and, and this allows me also to track individuals um, and to be able to, to, to understand and see the types of decisions that are made uh, over time. So one uh, part or one, one part of this uh, project looks at the role of good access to informational technology on educational outcomes um, of adolescents and the interaction that this might have with socioeconomic status. So I do this in, in, in the context of a large-scale digital plan pro, uh, program in France that provided students age 13 with their own or shared uh, digital tools, so tablets, in the classroom. And this type of technology, I mean, it, it, it has a huge potential to transform the traditional uh, classroom teaching. And We've seen large investments uh, to equip schools, and, and this was even before COVID changed the, the, changed the terms of the, the debate or the discussion around e-learning. But these are expensive policies, and it's, it's important, it's really essential to, to isolate and understand what works, what doesn't work, who does it work for. I mean, Essentially, it's, it's not obvious whether dig digital tools in the classroom are beneficial or harmful because on the one hand, it offers information, it can ha enhance uh, modern skills, but on the other hand, it, it may create distractions. It's also not clear how this impacts um, the way in which um, students socialize with, with one another within the classroom. Within this also, and another important aspect um, that has that interested me is, is the digital divide and the question of the digital divide uh, across um, socioeconomic status is, is an open one. I mean, even today we're seeing very important inequalities in terms of access to hardware, to broadband and even to, to things like training. Um, and so understanding where the better access in schools can help close some of these gaps is, is, is quite important. And, and more generally, I mean, as, as academics or even policy makers, we, we care more and more about the way um, digital tools are, are transforming the classroom, but it's just not very easy to evaluate them. And, and this wouldn't be because of the context, the representation, but it can also be because of the scale of the studies. So I think here within my project, I'm able to do several things. And, and one important thing is to be able to um, look at a program and given its scale, the, the time frame, the type of policy, it does allow to offer some internal and externally uh, valid um, kind of um, impacts of the digital tools on students and, and, and look at them at this formative age when they're making plans. The second is 
being able to look at very many different margins. So looking at the practices within the school, so the teachers, their skills, um, same thing for the school directors. And I think understanding what's happening and this sort of these, these institutional practices will help tell us about um, how to better target programs, for instance. And then the third, and I think again, an important um, aspect is being able to look beyond just the impact that these types of tools might have on, on academic test scores and look at, say, social or, or behavioral skills. And so being able to look at a number of a wider variety of outcomes is also a way to have a better sense of, of what works and, and why. Anyway, so, so moving from the research and to the application process, um, I would say for me, it was quite a journey to prepare for the ERC. Um, the first important non-trivial step is to think about the project and to think of it as this several year plan rather than simply one paper or research question. Then along with it is thinking about the team. So you often won't work alone and you need to plan and create a team of experts. And often this can be an interdisciplinary team uh, of experts. Also, as in my case, given the type of empirical questions um, I'm, I was interested in, I also needed to think carefully in advance about the data needs and feasibility. And also for that, I needed to establish links with, with key actors. Once I, I reached the second step, um, which meant I had to present my project to the panel and to be interviewed about it, the preparation was, was crucial. I mean, this meant preparing slides, um, and because time is limited, preparing some sort of dialogue around those slides. And I would say a very important part here, or an important piece of advice is to do this with, with plenty of time. You need to make decisions. I mean, time is very limited and the, there won't be time to talk about every aspect, especially within that presentation. So thinking very carefully about the delivery of slides of the slides is, 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 is the first important sort of part. Then practicing those slides. And this was really important for me. And I mostly did this with my colleagues, um, some of who were not specialists on the topic. Um, but this was again useful because this can be the case in the interview as well. And then I think Maybe one of the toughest parts of, of, the, of the, this process was the actual interview with its open questions. And of course, some of these questions are questions that you haven't thought about. Um, they're questions that are coming from panelists who are outside of your field, and it just goes so fast. And so sort of managing your time as best as you can is, is very important. Uh, so just to finish off, I want to say again, thank you for this kind invitation um, to talk at this wonderful event. And I wish you all an enjoyable day.